Welcome to That Annuity Show, the podcast that will make you an expert in explaining annuities to your clients. Give us 30 minutes each week and we'll shave hours from your client presentations. Now, here's your host, Paul Tyler. Hi, this is Paul Tyler, and welcome to another episode of That Annuity Show. Will Warcroft, how are you? Awesome. Great to be here. It was a hot weekend, right? That it was. It was. uh, Mark, I I, I think I planted 120 marigolds yesterday. My back is is certainly feeling it. You're glad to be back in the office today, aren't you? (laughs) Uh, Yes. (laughs) Nobody can put me back in in the planter box. Hey, Ramsey, so today's topic is uh, actually a, a super timely topic, right, which is indices. Uh, yeah. What makes a good indice? What makes good set of indices? Um, why don't you set us up and, and uh, introduce our guest today? Happy to do so. So, um, look, we're very lucky to have Lawrence Black from the Index Standard join us today, and he's going to talk about uh, you know, a system he's put together to evaluate indices. And, and look, this is something that's close to my heart. This is, this is a business that I was uh, involved in in my, in my prior career. And as I said before the call, like one of the great things about working on Wall Street is you get to work with a lot of smart people and you get to compete against a lot of smart people. And, and, and Lawrence and I, we didn't know each other, but we were competing against each other for quite a few years. And, you know, what's, what I'll say is like it's a, it's a, it is a complex area of the business it needs greater uh transparency and analytics and there's really no better people to do that than the people that have actually built some of these indices themselves so with that i'm gonna i'm gonna turn it over to you lawrence to tell us a little bit about your background and then we can get uh get right into this very timely and important conversation great thanks ramsey and i just want to say that i've actually really enjoyed listening to your show I kind of learned a lot from it so it's really great to to appear today So my background is I've spent about 20 years in investment banking, of which the last 15 have been designing and developing indices. And actually, I've been designing and developing indices for a long time, sort of 15 years ago when we were just doing simple thematic indices or sector indices. And today, I've sort of seen the evolution of where we're designing, you know, complex indices where we see complex mechanisms in risk control indices, defined outcome, multi-factor indices. So it's been great to see that evolution of of the index space, and I've built up two index businesses. And then the other thing that I've been fortunate in my career, been lucky enough to work with some pretty well-known investors. I've worked with uh, Jim Rogers, Joel Greenblatt, Robert Schiller, and Noriel um, Rubini. So I've learned a lot. And then, you know, I would say about two years ago, I wanted to do something a little more entrepreneurial. So I left banking and I thought, well, I'm going to design indices. After all, that's what I've done for 15 years. And I kind of took a step back. And what I realized was, you know, there are just so many indices and they've become so complex. So I thought the world doesn't need another complex index. Maybe what the world needs is someone to help decode and demystify them. So that's why I founded the Index Standard to help sort of try and bring some clarity, bring some awareness and understanding of how these more complex indices work. And we, do, and we do that through a series of rating systems, and we also do forecasts as well. So why don't we talk a little bit about how we got here. So Mark, what, go ahead. I was gonna say a quick question in terms of your, your rating structure, you know, the seven, uh, kind of seven standard categories that you have, transparency, robustness, risk, efficiency, returns, yeah. attractiveness, uh, and capital risk. Are those evenly weighted, or do you shift those from, from time to time in terms of how you put that weighting in place? Sure. So, so we, let me just get back up and give the sort of the audience a little bit of sense of what we do, and then I'll, I'll dig into to your question. So we rate and evaluate all complex indices, and we score them on with, out of 100 points. And what we do, Mark, is we actually compare like-to-like indices. So we want to compare the universe of dividend in- indices to a universe of dividend indices. And within that universe, we want to try and compare and find out which are the best. So we do that by sort of diving into those seven categories that you mentioned, and we do weight them a little bit differently. But essentially we have two categories where we look at um, transparency and robustness. And then we wanna dig in and really try and see what is going on. So is the index diverse? Does it have a lot of parameters? How complex is it? Is it, are the rules available? Is it, uh, is the index calculation agent, are they compliant with the IOSCO standards? And then what we do is we also look at a number of uh, sort of 
statistical factors and we have a slew of those covering what you would expect us to see. We try to look under the hood and really get a sense of what's going on. And there, you know, we might look to see if there's any fat tails, anything sort of happening there and has it got a propensity for positive returns. And then the final thing is, you know, everything I've mentioned in the terms of the statistical returns is backward looking. So we want to try and look forward as well. So we bring some of our forecasts in there to try and get a sense of how well are these indices going to do. And by looking at all these stats and comparing each index to each other, that enables us to see which is already a robust and well-designed index. And Lawrence, I, I'm not sure if I'm an agent where I, where I would turn for something like this today, ergo your business. Um, what are the best tools I have in my uh, toolkit right now that would allow me to weed through, I, I don't know, how many how many hundreds of indices are there available mm -hmm. in the in uh, portfolios today? Yeah, so, you know, that, that's the pertinent question, um, Paul, because, you know, there's probably about 160 of these indices. And, you know, I, I think there's a couple points worth noting. One is what I've been surprised about since I left banking and I was sort of selling them is now that I'm independent working at the index standard is, you know, people have sort of opened up. And I would say there is a, definitely a segment of advisors who just dislike these indices. And there are some sort of common misperceptions. And we can sort of dig into that. But I, th I think it's a tremendous shame that people dislike them because what they're doing is they're putting all their clients into the S&P 500. Now, this is the most important portfolio of their lives. They've worked their whole life for, and you're investing them in one asset. And, you know, that asset is a little bit overvalued, right? The S&P has got a cape of 37. So you want to give your clients a, a diversification, lots of different asset classes, lots of different type of exposures. So that's what these risk control indices can do. It can really be a, a fantastic tool in your toolbox to help the advisor build a diversified and balanced portfolio for the client. So I would encourage advisors to sort of dig into them and try and help their clients. And, and they're really that's why we founded the index standard is to help provide support to help decode them, to help advisors understand them. And that's what we do with our ratings and our forecasts. Hey, hey Lawrence, so <clears throat> the proliferation that you mentioned is, I mean, they just keep coming. <laughs> they keep coming out and, you know, their insurance companies are, as everyone knows, adding more to their annuity portfolios. When's enough and how do you see this playing out? Will we continue to see the proliferation or will we see it slow down? And what, what's driving it? Wow. So there's a lot going on there. So, you know, you know I think we'll probably we're never going to reach enough because there's always innovation happening. And, and innovation is really kind of good for the for good for the end end investor. Right. So what you've seen and, and this is a more general observation on the index industry. The index industry has grown tremendously. And I think it's grown for a couple of reasons. One is low cost. So the advisors like low cost. Um, because, you know, they're adding their fees on top and, you know, they want to keep that down. And also, if you're a pension fund, right, the easiest way to add alpha is to reduce your costs. So that's, you know, why we've seen trillions of, of dollars where pension funds are invested in the indices. So it's definitely low cost. And then what we've seen, we've seen so many different kinds of exposures that if you're an agent or an advisor, you can use these indices almost like as a building block like as a Lego block, for example. So if you've got a client who says, you know, I want a yellow house and a green roof, you can use all different indices to build that. Or another client who says, you know, I want a pink house with a white roof. You can build these kind of exposures. And one of the reasons we've seen so many of these indices grow is we're actually, their indexes are taking active management techniques and putting them into an index as, as if what a real portfolio manager would do. And then the final sort of sort of elephant in the room is performance. The passive indices have outperformed active management. If you look at the S&P SPIVA survey, you know, the last 10 years, it's 70% of indices have, well, also active funds have underperformed benchmark indices. So those are reasons that it's driving the growth. And then, you, you know, we've done all the benchmark indices. We've done all the simple sector indices. So we've done all the country indices so this is where you're seeing innovation and people are putting new and new things and you know it's getting more complex and you know will i would say in, in sort of the etf land we're seeing this a little bit in the uh, risk control indices you're seeing sort of defined outcomes and rylers where people are putting caps and buffers so that's the latest innovation and i'm you know we're going to see more with inclusion 
ESG. Um, so it, it's probably going to keep on coming. Yeah. It, so Lawrence, you had written an article a few months back that you know, talked about not all indices being the same. And, and one of the challenges um, with constructing these is the back casting where it can be, in a sense, over-engineered or over-concentrated. Is there, is there a solution to that or is there also a way to identify that up front as being a challenge? Mm. So, you know, this is probably the, one of the toughest challenges, Mark, because I, I would say designing an index for the insurance place is the most complex by far. Because what you're trying to do, do is design an index that, you know, performs well in the past because illustrations are so important in this particular segment of the, of the industry. You've got to design for huge capacity because the, the banks are selling options on it. And then, of course, the most important, you've got to design for future performance. So that's what makes it very complex. And in, in my experience, you know, it's taking run anywhere from six months to a year to design these indices because the banks put so much sort of scrutiny on them. And the temptation was really that you, you put in a lot of parameters and you get a great back test, right? But now we know that the future doesn't repeat from the past exactly. So the more parameters you put in, the less well your index is going to perform going forward. So it's a real balance. What you want to try and do is put a few parameters in as possible, but still get that back, good backcasting that will get, get you that good go forward performance. So it's really a balance. And then you have to think about that liquidity as well. So it's, it's a tougher space to design for. So, 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 you know, you touched on something really interesting there, Lawrence, which is uh, one of the things that we, we discussed ahead of this. So should we talk about hedging? Should we talk about other elements of it? But one thing that we talked about in prep that that uh, that you brought up was just how hard it is within a bank to create an index and run all the traps to have something that will that the bank will then be able to pitch to uh, to an insurance company. So maybe you can talk a little bit about that, like just how well vetted, at least from the better banks, that these indices will be, you know, before they actually hit the street. Yeah. No, listen, that's such a great observation, because what I've found is that these risk control indices, there's a, a lot of misperceptions around them. The advisors don't like them. And I would say they believe that there's high fees and that they're opaque. And, you know, we just don't trust some of the banks who are designing them. And, and that may have been true sort of 15 years ago. But now the banks and the index and the index providers, they have got such um, rigorous processes and due diligence on these indices that they're incredibly robust. So I'll sort of let me articulate that process that they will go through to give people a sense of the, the sort of robustness. So firstly, if you're designing an index within a bank, you've got probably a bunch of PhDs or guys who've got master's degrees, CFA. So you've got smart people designing these indices. And then they're actually drawing upon their whole research group that the investment banks have, and that can be a thousand people who are researching stocks and bonds. So it's a tremendous amount of brain power going in, first of all. Um, and then secondly, you know, the techniques to design these indices, everyone's got a lot smarter than 20 years ago. So what they might do is they might actually take a piece of back test, uh, a piece of historical data, and sort of take that out. Then they'll design the index. And then they'll run the parameters on that piece of data they took out to see how does it work. Or they might even design the index, let it run for a couple months to make sure that it's performing well. So there's a number of techniques like this that banks will do. So then they've now got an index that they think might be ready for market. And that process can take anywhere from three to six months, by the way. The banks are very careful not to over-engineer and optimize these indices. And then that index has to get reviewed. And so we've been speaking to a number of banks, and I would say they all have at least three committees to review these indices. So you'll have a committee to, re to review the, the parameters. You'll have committees to review whether the index is suitable for the end retail client and, and a number of sign-offs. So that's a lot of scrutiny committees. And then on top of that, the bank's um, compliance legal and risk departments will dig in. Now, so just to give a bit of context here, the banks were all burnt by the LIBOR scandal 10 years ago. And they are still terrified of that. They don't want to lose their reputation. So they put so much emphasis on scrutiny on these indices. So the risk team will actually go in and look, look and check the tradability. 
that it's hedgeable, that the end client is not disadvantaged. And in actual fact, one bank recently told us that their chief risk officer for the whole bank, he has to also sign off on these indices. Then you've got the compliance team looking in to make sure that there are no hidden fees. And in actual fact, I used to have to certify to compliance that when I was launching one of these indices that there were no hidden fees. So, you know, it was my sort of proverbial, you know what was on the line. And then, um, and then finally the legal team will look into it to make sure that it's fair and clear and not misleading in terms of the rules. And that sort of ends the process. So there is a huge amount of rigor and due diligence that goes into, into these indices. And I, I think the advisors probably don't know that, but they should be aware that really there's a very, very well, robust. I, I, I'm sure that this is, uh, th this causes a, a number of sleepless nights for risk management officers as they're evaluating some of the indices <laughs> that uh, come out. Uh, Lawrence, just to go back, uh, you, in, in terms of the factors, uh, you mentioned to Mark that uh, used to review yeah. this. Uh, one of those factors was uh, future performance. Uh, so I'm re really curious. I mean, clearly there are indices that have not performed well out of the gate. And maybe this was because of something that happened. It was a matter of timing in the market that was just peculiar for, you know, the three-month launch window. Um, do you see, you know, once a bad ind index, always a bad index? Do you see indices that say, you know, it was they didn't perform well the first year or two, but going forward, you think that they have strong prospects? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I would answer that in two ways. I would say one is, you know, there are some indices that may just be sort of looking at some factors that are out, out, out of favor. And secondly, there might be some indices that are, are not so well designed. So let me give you an example of each. So, so Paul, in, your, in the first case, you may have found an index that, let's say, has been focused on the on the value factor. So what we've seen with the S&P, that it's been a sort of growth factor where all the FANG names have done incredibly well. So if you had an index that was um, focusing on the value factor, you've probably underperformed. Now, when we think about our forecasting, and what we do, by the way, is we actually look at the wisdom of the crowds. We collect over 30 um, forecasts from the, from the market. And they actually see that the value factor in the next 10 years will probably do well. So that's a case where we would expect a bit of mean reversion, or which is just a fancy way of saying that an underperforming index should do well going forward. So that's the first case. Now, now the second case is, you know, where something is poorly designed. And, you know, I'll give you some examples. Um, and it's a little bit more in the, in, the, in the sort of thematic space. But I would say you see some MLP indices um, and these are energy master limited partnerships, and they have got more than 30% of that index is allocated to one stock. So I don't like that because if that one stock does well, or, or you, you do okay, but if it does poorly, you know, it's very hard for you to recover. Some other thematic indices, you know, I, I think you have to be a little bit careful that there is not actually enough stocks to fulfill that theme. So for example, in the AI and robotics space, there is an index that says we only allocate 40% of the stocks to the core theme because, you know, we just don't have enough. Now, the final sort of point about a, a, a bad index is, is it's very difficult to design a mechanism that's going to work well all the time. I'll give you an example. Let's say I was trying to switch between equities and bonds. And, you know, I can design an index and I can look at some, some parameter to try and get me the right signal. I can back test it, it might look good, but it's incredibly difficult to get that right if you're just always switching between equity and bonds. And if you're in bonds when equities do 30%, your index is never going to recover. So it's incredibly difficult to switch between you know, assets. So maybe instead of switching outright between 100% bonds, 100% equity, you want to have you know, a third in each and, a, and only the third of your switches. So it's things like that that you want to look for, things that are not a not over-engineered, too many parameters, or switching between asset classes. You want to look for diversification. Um, and, you know, also I like to see academic principles being used in, in, in parameters as well, Paul. In terms of your forecasting, Lawrence, how often is that adjusted and is it, is it event-driven or specific timing-driven? Mm -hmm. So what we go in, uh, Mark, and what we do actually, we have a sort of three-step process. We go in and every quarter we look at the wisdom of the market, as we call it. So we go and collect thir uh, all, the, all these forecasts from, um, 
investment managers and asset managers. And then that becomes you know, what we expect from the future. We average out those numbers. For then for each index, we look at the certain characteristics that that index have. And then we marry those characteristics with the forecasts using some accepted uh, statistical techniques. We bring it together in 10,000 simulations. And then that produces um, a forecast. Now, I'd make one or two observations here that actually forecasting is incredibly difficult. And I, th I think by using the wisdom of the crowds, that's a sort of very sensible approach because we're getting what, what the average of what smart people think. But also what we're doing, everything we're doing is a sort of in a rigorous and, uh, um, and systematic approach. Everything is consistent. You know, we're not, we're not an, an insurance company who's saying, well, we expect the S&P to return 15%. Someone else might say 10, someone else might say five, and then an advisor's trying to compare all these forecasts. Everything we do is consistent and rigorous, and it enables sort of apples to apples comparison. So you can use our forecasts to allocate or select um, indices because we're doing it in a consistent and rigorous uh, manner. Hey, Lawrence, how do we, <clears throat> you mentioned advisors, how do we, make sure they're educated enough to share kind of the mechanics of some of these indices with their clients. Yeah, well, well the clients I mean, listen, that, that's the challenge Especially of the industry, kind of one of the reasons I founded the index standard. Um, one of the sort of principles I have is we try and use clear and straightforward language. Now, one of the sort of favorite terms of some of the people I used to work with was negative convexity. And that's like a, a Wall Street derivative desk. And I can see Ramsey smiling, right? You're, not many people understand that. So what we try and do is we explain everything in clear and simple terms with our ratings. Now, what we do is we obviously produce a rating and we have platinum, gold or silver or copper. So you can at a glance see if something is good. And then we actually take great care in doing two other things. One is we write a description of the index in plain language. So if you're an advisor, you can look at that description and it's only three or four lines. So you can get a sense of what's going on. And then we also write a further sort of what you need to know, which is what we think about the index. So we try to do everything in using clear and straightforward language. So if you're the advisor, you can easily at all, you know, just look at the top, the, the front page of our ratings and get a sense of what the rating is, how it works and what do I need to know. And that we think you can convey to, you know, the agent can use that, advisor can use that, and they can also convey that to, to the end client who can understand what they're buying is that's what we want. We want people to understand what they're buying. Lawrence, well, definitely, I agree. I agree, hundred percent. Have you seen any trending shifts in terms of your subscribers, like weighted, you know, yeah, broker you know, versus I, insurance I would say we're, we're finding a great amount of traction from the the RIAs, uh, really, um, and and also to an extent the the broker dealers, where everyone, where anyone has got a large network, and we were speaking to someone the other day, and they were saying, oh, we've got 114 of these indices, and oh my gosh, it's so hard for us to evaluate them. Our, our guy who used to do this left, and we just don't know what to do. And, and you know, clients like that are absolutely really coming and gravitating towards us. And we've seen strong demand for our indices because people just, there's just too many out there. And, and as Will pointed out, they've just become too complex. We're seeing a lot of sort of research firms, platforms are, are actually also approaching us with really interested in providing us those ratings. And the other kind of thing that, that I found over the last 18 months is when I sort of started the business, I, I thought that our ratings and evaluations would help people on the sales side. So it might help make our sales process a little easier because we can show our ratings to the agent and the end client. But what's kind of surprised me is the level of um, demand around the sort of compliance aspect. So you know that the fiduciary rules or the best interest rules are strengthening. There's sort of really the Biden administration is looking at strengthening those. So that's a top of people's minds and they want to use our ratings as a sort of way to demonstrate compliance with fiduciary or best interest because, you know, we rate all the indices and we can sort of clearly say how your index does against its peer group and you can sort of track that quarter on quarter and that becomes a way to demonstrate that we are tracking what we're recommending with an eye to fiduciary or best interest uh, rules. Interesting. Now, from, from a carrier standpoint or even an agent standpoint, how many indices are ideally inside a product, mm -hmm. right? Because clearly some sector 
was in favor is now not in favor some strategy is not and you've, you've alluded to this uh should an ideal product have three yeah you know, well-performing indices four five six yeah. you know i think it's somewhere between three and six paul i mean what i would say you know just having the s p as your sole index is not the right answer and i was speaking to an advisor the other day and and it was kind of interesting because they were not interested in our index in our index reviews and i was kind of a little like puzzled and then it turns out she said to me well we just want our clients to sell the s p 500 and that that's all so i was like wow okay i think you should sort of want to broaden your that client's exposures give them some more choices so you, you know i think maybe eight is too many because then you've got you have to educate the agents and advisors on eight complex indices so that's tough so i think it's that that kind of sweet spot between three and six allows you diversification and different exposures to build the client, each client, a different kind of portfolio that'll, that'll meet their needs. You know, the thing that sort of strikes me when you give that example is, you know, the, the value of having, having a system to evaluate uh, indices isn't just about what you might put your client in going forward. You know, uh, assets move around. People, people pick up new agents. Uh, people pick up new agents, they pick up new RIAs. And so a lot of RAs may inherit portfolios that include, that include um, index-based products. And if they're gonna move their, their, their clients out of those old products into something new, they need a justification for that too, if they're gonna be following the fiduciary standard. So you know, it's, it's, it's important for offense and defense, you know, if you will. Yeah, I completely agree. Because right, right now, if you were thinking about investing, you, know, you might be thinking, well, I want a multi-asset index or, I want to put some assets into international equities because you know the U.S. has done so well. Or maybe I want something a little bit far, that, that is value oriented because growth has done so well. But then you know actually exactly as, as you point out, Ramsey, in a couple of years you want that choice because maybe value's done very well. And you say, well, I'm, I want to go back into growth, or you know, EFA's done really well, and I want to go back into the U.S. because you know these products, as you say, they can go up to ten years. So you want a, a good choice to be able to allocate to the current environment, but also it needs to be able to cope with the future environment that, that an advisor might might face. So, so I just I, had a quick, go, go ahead, Paul. No, I, I just had this great idea while we were on this show. I want, Lawrence, I want to do a digital currency index. <laughs> so so tell me, how, how would you look at this? Okay. Uh, uh, from your your framework, yeah. you know, it's thinly traded. I, I, how do you, how would you start to evaluate something like that? Yeah, well, I mean, I, I would say is a, a couple things. I mean, I'd say crypto is all the rage, and kind of like the value is in the eye of the beholder. So, assuming there are some people who think there's value, I mean, the way I would like to see crypto incorporated in into an index in this space is probably in two ways. You know, firstly, I'd like to see it as maybe as a small piece of a portfolio where it's, you know, one or two percent, because I think that, you know, that's where it should be. It might be an alternative to gold if you don't believe in, in fiat currencies. So that's a nice way to play it. Well, the other way is, you know, as, as everyone knows, right, cryptocurrencies are tremendously volatile. They go up, they go down. I mean, crypto hit 65,000. It's now 36 as we speak. So that's a huge amount of volatility. So maybe what you could do is you would have a volatility control mechanism around it and then only, again, put it as a piece of the, the, the portfolio. But I think there are definitely ways for it to come in into this, this, this space. And you know what? I'm, I, I would expect maybe in the next couple of years we might even see that. Why not, right? So, yeah, I'd worry about liquidity and tradability as a, you know, as, as a constraint. That was always a big thing as we developed indices, making sure that like, especially once it gets bigger, right? If you have a successful absolutely. index, I mean, you absolutely. don't want the, your success to outsize the, um, the liquidity in the market yeah, for the underlying right. assets. I mean, that's yeah, exactly we'll, we'll, right. And that's why I said you want, a little, you want it to be a little piece yeah. of, the, of that portfolio. Exactly right. You have to make sure you can trade it, deliver it, the whole package as an option. So yeah, great observation, Ramsey. Yeah, well, what kind of compliance challenges do you see as we add more and more indices inside a product Well, kind of what I mentioned earlier is just the, the knowledge, the training, the understanding, um, the complexities, the vol, the vol controls that are being inserted on, on, on a variety of different indices where 
you really need to understand that. And if you're really trying to build a full asset allocation model within a specific product, you've got to understand the, the ind indices that you're talking about um, and how they work. And, and I do think there's, you know, there's a challenge there because like, like Lawrence said, it's easy when you have one or two and you can just talk about those, you know, you can talk about those cause you're, you're so familiar with those. But as we see more, um, we're asking more of our agents to be able to explain and articulate the complexities that are contained. So I think that's a challenge. I do think it's a good thing, obviously, to have choice, to be able to allocate into a more diversified asset allocation model, you know, whether that's international or value or some of the other things we've talked about. But with that comes, you know, the, the need to make sure that yeah, you're doing well, a Lawrence, more so education without naming that may names, not be necessary when you only have um, one or two. Are there institutions that have actually created such a strong brand name in this space that an advisor is going to say, oh my gosh, this was vetted by this bank, that there will be market advantage? Or have we not matured as an industry yet to that point? So I actually think we are maturing to that stage where, you know, actually, I don't know if many people know, but risk control indices have been around for 25 years. They sort of emanated in Europe. So they actually are getting mature. I think we're sort of onto the third generation of complexity. We can talk a little bit about that, but I actually think there are a couple of index houses and, and banks that actually have premier brand names because they've just designed some fantastic indices. And, and there are some indices that are just really amazing. There's some multi-asset indices that use mean variance optimization from some of the big banks. They all have got their own versions and, and I love them. I mean, they done very well and actually you know from the end advisors point of view what you're actually getting is a fantastically sophisticated institutional asset allocation mechanism and you're probably paying 50 basis points a year for that that that's incredible that you're getting this technology in an index that you can use in your portfolio so i think there's a lot of good things um but then you know there's other one aspect that i want to touch upon is, is complexity and will you sort of touched upon that is you know we've gotten pretty complex, right? And as you said, Will, right, it's how can the advisor explain that? And, you know, how much com more complex can we get? And that's, I think, a question. And I was actually just talking to someone in the industry the other day. We feel that we're maybe at the edge of that a, a little bit because they are so complex. And, you know, the index standard is here to sort of try and help decode and demystify them, but they are complex. But you can, you can sort of look through the mechanisms and we're here to help get people understand what, what they're doing. So Lawrence, like, what do you, who do you see as your, um, your inspirations, right? There are a variety of rating agencies out there. So there, right, there's S&P and Moody's in some, in one area, there's Morningstar, there's JD Power. Um, wh who do you view as, who do you want to be as a rating agency in this space? Who do you view yeah. as like your, the standard, the index standard is looking to, to match? Yeah, I'm going I'm to give you kind of like a, an unexpected answer there, Ramsey. So, okay. so what I would say is, listen, I mean, that, those, those companies you named, <laughs> they, do a, <laughs> listen, they, they do a fantastic job. And what we want to be is really like the sort of consumer report or the Zagat guide. But our standard is actually, and it's funny, I have a, a partner, Jay Watson, and we, we talk about this. Our standard is actually we are th solving for our grandmother's advisor. We want our grandmother's advisor to know everything about an index so that she can sell it to my grandmother. And that's a good index because, you know, we've got real people's money is being invested. So we want to get help people get the best outcome. So that's that's what we're solving for sort of my grandmother's agent or advisor, actually. That happened to you once, though, right? Tell us that story. Yeah, it's, that, that's kind of that, that's so true that. I remember, you know, sort of in 2006, I designed my second or third index and, and I was a young analyst and, it, and, and you sort of may tend to think, oh, it's just about producing a good index. And I got a call from a friend and he said he wanted to talk about the index. Now he was working at an asset manager, so I was quite excited. I thought maybe he's going to buy the index. So I was all ready with my statistics. I had the brochure. I knew everything about the index. So he called me up and then he said, my mother bought the index in a portfolio in a, in a product and I want to talk about the performance. And that kind of hit me because I was like, oh my gosh, my friend's mother has bought the index. Like the, the duty of care I have when I'm designing these is huge. So I want 
they must do well because you know my my friend's mother my grandmother could be putting her money into these indices so i want them to do well so that's kind of where this duty of care to to my grandmother comes from it, it it's a real experience yeah hey th th this was tremendous and and uh I, th th there's nothing like uh, actually understanding the impact of the work we have. I think we do get caught up, you know, all too frequently in the numbers and don't understand that they're real people and, and real lives uh, that, that uh, depend on what we're doing. So, I don't know, uh, final questions, thoughts, Will, Mark? I know I just thought this was a great, great uh, conversation. It's really important. You know, a lot of our annuities that we're sell that are, you know, that our agents are selling have a variety of indices in them. And we're seeing, like we've talked about the proliferation. So it's really incumbent upon us all to understand um, how they're working, why they're growing, and are, are we doing a good enough job explaining them to, to our agents and ultimately to our customers. So this is it's a my great, pleasure. Uh, great conversation. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Lawrence. And I really like the... Um, I like really the comparison side by side of both the historical and the forecasting. I mean, I think oftentimes the industry spends too much time looking at historical mm -hmm. performance and not enough in terms of where, where the puck is going, if you will. And uh, I, think, I think your perspective on this. Is so really, really, um, really from my perspective, as somebody who was in the weeds in this business for, you know, with all its complexities right, for, for, for many, many years, I'm actually really, I'm really excited about like your rating system, like the simplicity of the rating system platinum, gold, silver. I, I think that um, there, are, there, are, there, are, there are far too many advisors out there um, for us to be able to get everybody to the same level of, of, of um, knowledge as somebody who's been in the business like yourself. So ultimately, to the extent that you can build this, this third party, you know, it's a neutral third party rating system that can be used broadly based on based on this simple rating system, which is really what we see with the S and P and Moody's and everything else. I think that's I think that's quite powerful. So that's the part that I'm you know I'm most excited about because you know you're putting the intellectual rigor behind it, and then you're you've got a very simple delivery mechanism so people can make informed decisions. Yeah. No. The, hey. Yeah, no, I agree. That's in... Go ahead. Oh, Lawrence, please. Well, I was just going to say, we're sort of using my, my 15 years worth of experience. And in a way, it's sort of like a little bit like a, a poacher turned gamekeeper that we are um, using all that knowledge to try and help advisors, you know, get the best out of these indices and create diversified portfolios for their clients. A poacher turned gameskeeper. There, there we go. Um, <laughs> I like that description. Hey, uh, Lawrence, thank, thanks so much. And I think uh, I, I just second Ramsey's uh, uh, viewpoint, which is I think you're bringing uh, a a solution to a problem that's existed in this market for a while, and it's only going to get bigger, uh, given uh, fiduci the fiduciary standard, best interests, uh, you know, coming down the pike, and uh, a lot more people retiring. And uh, so, look forward to uh, you know Indeed. following your your company as you grow. Hope to have you have you back and and share more of your insight as uh, as I'm sure this market will take even a, another rapid uh, uh, evolution the next uh, 12 to 18 months. So, hey, thanks so much. And uh, thanks, everybody, for joining us. Again, give us feedback. Uh, tell us who you'd like to hear. And if you have more questions, please reach out. And, and Lawrence, where's the best place for people to uh, find out more about your company? Sure. Thanks, Paul. So you can go to the theindexstandard.com. Or you can email us at info at the index and we'd love to interact with people, you know, engage, ask us questions and we can uh, we can get better and we can certainly let you know Good. what we do. Excellent. Doing. Hey, thanks so much. Thanks for listening and uh, tune in again next week for another episode of That Annuity Show. Thanks for listening. If you've enjoyed the show, please rate and recommend us on iTunes, Stitcher, Overcast or wherever you get your podcasts. You can also get more information at thatannuityshow.com.